So next, uh, we we'll speak about the, the different methods of reduction, disclosed reduction, open reduction, and everything. So closed reduction is indicated when the fracture is undisplaced or it's favorable. That is, the fracture is not segments are not separate from each other. And in grossly comminuted fractures, when there are multiple pieces, and if we try to do an open reduction, we open up the fracture, the bone segments might end up non-vital. So in such cases, closed reduction is more indicated. And in mandibular fractures in which uh, in children with developing dentition, so that we do not disrupt the tooth eruption, we uh, do closed reduction. Coronoid process, which does not come into occlusion, uh, can be taken up for closed reduction. And condylar fractures, wherein the surgical correction is more complicated. So condylar fractures are uh, mostly treated with closed reduction. Now, the advantages are that it is inexpensive, it's a conservative treatment, uh, it's a convenient treatment, it gives good occlusion, operation theater is not required, uh, closed reduction or intermaxillary fixation can commonly be done with uh, stainless steel wires, and it's generally easy, there is no operator skill that is required. Now, the disadvantages are we cannot uh, obtain an absolute reduction of the two segments. That is, we might get good occlusion, but there might be gaping in between the two fracture segments. And uh, since closed reduction uh, is for a longer period of time, it's not for a few hours or uh, days, it goes on for at least uh, four to six weeks. So, the patient's nutrition status is compromised, oral hygiene becomes poor. It's a longer period. As I said, the time period is longer. The patient can have weight loss. There's a decreased range of motion because of the immobilized condyle. The patient can have a decreased rate of motion and risk of wounds to the operator. Now, open reduction. Open reduction means we are surgically opening up the fracture and uh, we are seeing uh, the two fractured segments and manually reducing them. So it is indicated in unfavorable fractures, especially in the angle of mandible, so that one side of the fracture does not have teeth. So we cannot uh, attain a uh, proper reduction without opening it surgically. Now, uh, unfavorable fractures in the parasympathetic region, uh, multiple fracture uh, in patient bones, mid-phase fractures and bilateral condylar fractures are often treatment, treated with open reduction. Fractures of edentulous mandible and severely displaced fractures, wherein we cannot there can be a malunion when uh, open closed reduction is used. So we use open reduction. Edentulous maxilla means we cannot get occlusion to put the maxilla and mandible into IMF. In such cases, open reduction is more done. And in malunion cases, when closed reduction is already tried, and it has failed, we can go for open reduction. Advantages are that it is an accurate reduction, the fixation. Uh, of the fractures by direct and uh, we are fixing the fracture with direct visualization. There is better bone healing. Uh, patient can uh, return to their normal function uh, in the immediate next day. Uh, normal nutrition and there is no weight loss. Patient can maintain good oral hygiene and uh, early return to work. Now disadvantages are that this open reduction is a surgical procedure. So everything that uh, a surgery under general anesthesia brings some complications with itself. So there is a surgical wound that we create. Patient will require general anesthesia. It is expensive. And compared to IMF, it is more difficult. It is more risky. And uh, if we open up the fracture, there is a chance of infection scarring and foreign body embedded in the tissue. Now let's talk about the different approaches to the mandible. Now, the symphysis region can be approached with a vestibular incision. Now, this uh, provides good access to the fracture. And uh, But in case of comminuted fracture and uh, edentulous fracture, uh, we might require a heavier plates, which means we need to, if we require a plate in the lower border of the mandible, a vestibular incision cannot be. So we are placing an incision along the vestibule that is for four to five mm below the attached digiva, leaving a cuff of top soft tissue so that we can suture it. And at the mental uh, nerve region, we are uh, moving slightly upwards and going towards the attached digiva. Now, uh, if we cross the uh, vestibular incision at the same level towards the uh, parasympathesis region, the mental nerve can be injured. Okay, 
So the mucosal incision is canine to canine, it's 10 to 15 mm away from the attached gingiva. And posterior to canine, it is 5 mm away from the attached gingiva. As I told you, it curves upwards. Now, the direct mucoperiosteal flap is raised. We separate the mentalis muscle and uh, the mental, uh, the branches of the mental nerve. We have to locate the mental nerve on each side. Now, this is a surgical exposure of the symphysis fracture. Okay. Now, uh, up to the uh, body of mandible, this is the same procedure. As I told you, we can do uh, vestibular incision. So, this incision can be extended up to the second molar region wherein the symphysis, parasympathesis and body fractures can be visualized and reduced. Now, at the end, we need a different approach. Now, when there is no third molar present, the same vestibular incision can be continued along the anterior border of the ramus. If there is an interrupted third molar, that means we are going through a clavicular incision and posterior releasing incision so that the angle and the external oblique ridge is exposed. Now, this can cause injury to the buccal nerve. The buccal branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve, the mandibular nerve, can be injured in this incision, but that would be okay. It will recover later on. Next is using existing lacerations, especially in road traffic accidents and assaults. About, along the fracture, the patient can have external laceration. So this is one major technique where we can use the external laceration to reduce the fracture. Now, according, sometimes according to the location of the laceration, there can be uh, vascular, neurovascular injury that is caused for the, uh, the nerves and the blood vessels may be injured. Now, this is a submental approach. We'll go through this quickly. Submental approach is uh, can be used along the curvature of the mandible or along the submental phase. This is used to expose the lower border of the mandible in the symphysis region. Okay, a bilateral extension of the submental incision can be used to cover the uh, body of the mandible region. Now, this is a submandibular approach, which is a, a curvilinear incision about two to three centimeters below the inferior border of the mandible. This is more used in angle fractures. If there is a comminuted angle fracture or a condylar fracture, we use this incision. So the incision is placed in the skin piece. Uh, the marginal mandibular nerve of the facial artery and the uh, marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve at the facial artery can be encountered in this incision. So this careful dissection is done to prevent injury to the nerve. Now, the platysma muscle has to be divided approximately two to three centimeters away from the mandibular border. Then the pterygomasitic sling is cut sharply and we expose the fracture site. Now, bone plate osteosynthesis. So, uh, com non compression plates or compression plates can be used in uh, fixation of the fracture. The first, uh, bone, the, we can use biodegradable screws and plates when, the, when it is a child or we cannot do a second surgery to remove the plate. Three dimensional plates and titanium mini plates can also be used. Now, these titanium mini plates uh, are uh, used, are what is commonly used now because of the uh, because titanium plates can be taken up by the bone, can osteointegrate, and the plate, unlike the stainless steel plates, these need not be removed at a later stage. So nowadays, titanium mini plates are the most commonly used ones. Okay, uh, so uh, this is the major part of uh, fracture reduction and fixation. Now, uh, after fixation, the wound is closed in layers, and uh, we have to. Uh, irrigate the wound so that there is no contamination. We have to remove any foreign bodies or bone fragments that is left off and we close the layers. We keep the patient in strict antibiotic prophylaxis and we give at least three to four weeks for the bone to heal. Now, uh, in cases of closed reduction, we have to ask the patient not to touch the fracture area for the next two to three weeks so that they do not apply a unwanted pressure and uh, fracture it again. So this is, these are the precautions we take. Now the most commonest complications are infection. The fracture sites can get infected. The plate can get infected. 
patient can have a malunion, patient can have neurovascular injuries. Okay, so uh, that will be all for the mandibular fractures, where I will see you in the next class.